This is on a subject that concerns every one of us. Um, and I'm going to start with two people I know for, um, that are more affected than others. Uh, this is my good friend Elisabeth. Uh, she lives in Amsterdam. She has some Nigerian heritage, but she's born and raised in Greece, so she considers herself Greek. Uh, and she's now witnessing how her friends and family are all um, highly affected by the current economic crisis that they have in Greece. Um, many of the old people don't know if they're going to get a pension. Many of her friends have worked for months without getting payment from their employers. So um, they actually have to sue their employers and to get the money they, they need. Elisabeth, she loves her country, her friends and family. She wants to go back, but right now she doesn't feel she can't because there's nothing to come back to in Greece. And another person who really wants to come back um, is my friend Dima. And you can see that it's pretty difficult for him to do that. He's in Russia right now. Um, he's facing up to seven years in prison. And the reason his crime is that he was on board a boat, peacefully protesting against this oil rig in the Arctic Sea. And we all know that drilling for oil in the Arctic is devastating, both for the local environment and for uh, the global climate change, and still we're doing it because we have a, a global economy that has a hunger for oil that drives into new places all the time, getting to whatever you can find. Um, so both Dimas and Elisabeth's problems are related to the world economy. And me, being a bit nerdy, engineer, I would like to um, make a likeliness uh, with an electric grid. And it would be a the world economy as an electric grid would be pretty linear. It would be focusing on having big plants and producing power for the consumers, you can see in the bottom. And the focus would be on growth, that everything would, would grow all the time. So we'd be build, a, build bigger and bigger plants, and um, you have to sell more and more power to the consumers. And, it, when, and when the consumers can't buy any more power, when, when they don't have enough money, you have to start loaning to them so they can buy even more. And that's the situation we are in today. We're loaning lots and lots of money. We know about some countries in Europe, like Ireland, um, Greece, and Spain, that they have economic problems. But when you actually, actually look at the facts and see how much we, we've loaned per person, um, looking both at public debt and private debt, we're actually more indebted um, in so-called well-run economies, like Sweden and uh, UK and Germany. But this is something that that politicians don't want to talk about because it's, it's troublesome to see that we might soon be in the same position as the Greeks are, as Elisabeth and her friend, friends are. And what's also troubling is that we loan all this just to increase our consumption. And when we increase our consumption, we also increase our, our um, extraction of natural resources. Uh, and we all know about oil and, and, and climate change. But there are many other things. Uh, we're, not, we're not living as much in the digital and virtual world as we th think. For instance, do you know how much stone you use every year? Anyone? Think about it. You know, 10 kilos, 100 kilos? Fact is, we use about two tons as a global average. So, of course, we use much more. And this is not only about stone, it's about everything. In the coming four decades, we're expected to take more minerals from Earth than we have during the entire history of humankind. We're not going virtual, we're just taking more and more. And that has uh, environmental consequences. Now, when I started thinking about this, I thought, this is an absurd system, this is not sustainable, we have to rethink it, so how do we do that? Uh, and I want to go back to my nerdy field of, of uh, engineering, um, and there's a concept called smart grids. Um, and smart grids are designed to make good use of electricity. You don't only have um, power going around the lines, you also have information being transferred around the lines. And this transformation, this information is giving the right incentives for different players within this economy uh, or this electricity grid. Um, so it, when there's a lot of high production of power somewhere, then the consumers get incentives. You can buy a little more. And when there's no production or very little production, um, the consumer gets incentives that you should reduce your consumption now. And there's this, if, if you have a smart thinking in energy, you also think more about the service. Like, what are we using the electricity for? Um, because you focus on what you want to do with electricity. Um, so, you, um, today there are companies selling power um, that would have a, a consultant service to people that they sell, um, they, they help you reduce the power uh, instead of selling more power to you. So we need that kind of thinking. 
as well. So I started devising something I call a smart economy, and it's based on three basic principles. First of all, addressing national boundaries, uh, and then working goal-oriented, like what kind of services do we actually want? Uh, and thirdly, creating the incentive to match these two sometimes conflicting objectives. Uh, and when it comes to working with natural boundaries and taking them, taking natural resources in con into consideration, that's something that's been done, for instance, by the World Bank. They devised something called a spreadsheet for countries, and this is kind of how I would picture it. Um, and it takes other aspects into consideration, like how, how are the natural resources, how, are the so how is the social capital, and uh, how much stock do we have of um, other material um, assets. So if a country has a high GDP um, growth, but at the same time is depleting their natural resources, you can see that maybe that, companies, that country is actually getting less wealthy, so they need a new policy. So this is the first step to working with sustainability. Um, and to take the next step then is to look at the, the total boundaries that we have for our economy. Uh, this is something that Stockholm Resilience Center and many scientists that are involved with the center have, have thought about. And they created something that's called planetary boundaries. And that's what's shown here. You can see different aspects of sustainability and, and of resources. Uh, the yellow bars show how much human activities are affecting our, our, um, these different aspects. And the green circle in the middle, that's a safe operating zone. So as long as we're inside there, we're pretty safe. But when we go outside that green circle, it means we're starting to affect ecosystems and uh, different uh, environmental systems in ways that it could have unpredictable or unlinear changes. And that's where we are today when it comes to, for instance, climate change or um, biodiversity losses. And we need to get back into that green circle because otherwise we could have eco uh, ecological collapses. So how, would you, how do we work with this? I would like to set this as a foundation for the economy that we go together and kind of set, see um, where, where should we set a limit. And once we set that limit, then, then we, you can design a policy from that. So, for instance, setting a carbon tax with the goal of reducing carbon emissions to a certain level. And then if it, if it looks like you're not reaching that limit, you have to increase the carbon tax. But you, have, you start with the natural resources. Problem is today, we're not doing that. Uh, we're just growing our GDP uh, all the time. Um, and at the same time, the, the global resources are diminishing, and eventually we reach a point where it crashes. So some people have devised the thought that we should still have a steady-state economy, like fix our GDP to a certain level, but that is a very static thinking, uh, and it focuses on the wrong thing, which is GDP. A smart economy wouldn't focus on something like that. A, sm a smart economy doesn't even focus on GDP. It can be anything. As long as it stays within the bounds, then the smart economy could have a higher or lower GDP. It's focusing on the services. Um, so then, what kind of services should we focus on? And that question um, was given to Joseph Stiglitz, who is an economic prize winner um, from uh, the French president, former French president, uh, Sarkozy. So he set together a group working for the U European Commission and found other ways of, um, of measuring how well a country is doing. It has to do with... Um, the social, the social life of people, if health, education, and environment. And I think this, this should not only be a way of, of measuring, but also this should be the goals that we have in society. We should set our policies towards this. And when, when I start looking at it, much of it has to do with income and work. Um, and I'm going to funify this a bit, because when I was a kid, I used to read Bamse. And in Bamse, there's this guy called Shellman. It's a funny green guy with a hat. Uh, and he devises this machine in one of the strips that's an ultimate cleaning machine, and it has an immediate public success because it's so effective at, at cleaning. The problem is that it makes all the janitors who do the, did the work previously, it made them unemployed. Okay, so Shellman sees his problem, and since he's such a, a good person, he takes it back. He de-invents the machine, puts it in a closet for its own personal use. And of course, you can do that if you're in a cartoon world and you're the only inventor in the world. Um, and then the janitors get their jobs back and everybody's happy. I don't know about you, but I don't look that happy when, when I'm cleaning. And the thing is that this raises a question. If machines can take on jobs from humans that is boring or um, hazardous to us, 
working in a factory your whole life. Might be fun, you know, for half a year, but your whole life, I don't know. Um, why, why is that such a problem? Well, it's only a problem because our current economy makes it a problem. Because our income is so highly fixed to that we have a job. But if there aren't enough jobs, and if machines can do our jobs, why do we have to stick to this model? And why do we have to stick to a model where all taxes come from income? If we can change that, then, I mean, we don't have a problem anymore. What, what would you do if you were free? If you didn't have to work for income? Just think about it for a minute. Um, and still, if you do this kind of economy, if, if you create something like this, you could, for instance, have a basic economy for everyone. Um, so you have a certain a guaranteed income. Um, even in that kind of economy, you, would have, you could still have incentives for people to do the job that's needed. What is more difficult is to create the right incentives for companies, because the only incentive companies have today is to increase their profits, increase their sales, and it might be good in some cases, but in other cases, Actually, we don't, we don't want the companies to sell us too much of this stuff, like drugs, alcohol, sugar. So we need to create new business models, but the, the main focus of companies is to be of service and not just increase their profits. And of course, you get into discussion, should we have capitalism, should we have communism, and people argue that. I'll say that a smart economy is neither, neither of those two, and both of them. You have to think in new ways and outside these, these bounds. Um, and Primarily, we have to work with the financial sector, because today it's a very, today it's a very big player, uh, which has an undue effect on our, our life. It's driving this debt, and it's driving uh, the growth. And I would say we need to shrink this part, if we should even have it in a smart economy. It has to be there to provide a service to human communities, not vice versa. We're not, there to make them, to make, we're not here to make them happy. They're here to make us happy. And if they're not, they shouldn't be there. And particularly, we need to think over the whole thing of loaning, interests, and debt. And you have to understand that since the onset of human civilization, debt is something that has been used by people to put others in a difficult situation. Like you would, you would lend money to someone you know, 5,000 years ago, and then when he couldn't pay back, you took his, his house, you took his land, and you, you took his family members. And it, was such, it became huge social problems, societal problems in those days. So they actually created institutions to make sure that people weren't giving out debt with an inter loans with an interest, or making sure that they would cancel debt. So, for instance, the, the Christian Jubilee year is a time when you cancel debt and you return your family members. And that's why she's so happy, because she's been somebody, somebody's slave. And that's something we need as well. We need a Jubilee year for our economies. You know, start paying back and just maybe just cancelling lots of death. It would be very much more complicated today than it was in ancient times, but it's something we need to start considering, because it's not sustainable what we're doing today. Finally, in order to do this, in order to, be, to create a smart economy, we need to be smart ourselves. And to do that, we need to have an exchange of information. We need free information, we need unbiased information. That's one of the most important questions of our times. Um, and having uh, free information and sharing of free ideas, that's what we've been doing here today at TEDx.